All right. Welcome to spring semester. Uh, my name is Mike Zellers, and this is CISS 216. And a couple things that you will notice in the, in, in the classroom here is that we're in a special classroom. We have people at the North Ridgeville campus. Can you hear me at the North Ridgeville campus? Uh, are, you the, are you the exact same student that took it last year? Because I swear, they sat in the same spot, and every time I asked for an acknowledgement, they gave the same <laughs> like that. So that must, be the, that must be like the secret North Ridgeville greeting or something. Uh, anyhow, uh, so we do have students that are off campus. This, there's also an online section of this course, and I post my videos to Angel, so that you can see them. And I do that for a number of reasons. First of all, if you wake up some morning and your car doesn't start or you have the flu or whatever and you can't make it in the class, you can always watch the video of it. All right? Uh, and for the online students, it gives them a chance to participate in the fun of the lecture sessions as well. Almost. It's not quite as good as being there, but at least they can, they can do that. So sort of a win-win situation for everyone, I think. I also have post, I also have combined all three sections, the original section, the, the Illyria section, and the camp, or on, and the online section into one section. So everyone logs into the same section on Angel, which is good because then if there's a discussion or something like that, you can get all students' viewpoints. In addition, I invite students, no matter where you're taking this course, to come here on campus if you want to. If there's something in particular you're having difficulty with, you're welcome to, if you're taking it online, you're welcome to come in on here. Additionally, I invite everyone from all of my classes to come to any of my lab sessions, if that makes any sense. And I'll post a schedule at some point, but for example, let's say you're working on, on a project and you're, you get stuck with something and you, you don't want to wait until the next class. You just you can't sleep at night until you get this problem solved or whatever. Um, and it is not a Tuesday or Thursday. It, you know, it, it just happens uh, on a Monday. I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday classes. So you can come to a Monday lab if you want to get some extra help. In addition, I'll have office hours posted. I do all this because I think it's important for people, whether they be in a campus class or or online or, or at one of the satellite uh, branches to have an opportunity to come in and get their questions answered. Um, so I'll post a more full schedule. Uh, I, I don't think there'll be any issues this week where you'll need extra help. You know, we're just getting started out. But um, if, you, if you do have questions and you want to see me, let me know and I can give you the information um, to, uh, to be there. Let me start out uh, and go over some of the basic stuff that I'm, I'm sure you probably get to see in, in all your classes. Um, I won't, I'll, I'll try not to spend tons of time on it because I do want to get into the course material today. Um, and and it, there's no sense in me reading the syllabus if you can read it on your own. And you should read it on your own. Some professors put bonus points in their syllabus. I, I don't do that. I trust you that you're going to read it just because you should read it. Um, but you never know, maybe I'm lying now. <laughs> really? Which, which class? Okay, is that a Huffman class? Oh, well, that explains it. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. All right. One thing I will try to do, you, you notice people here and people in Ridgeville, you have a little button in front of you. If you press that button, what will happen is the camera will zoom in on you and, <laughs> and, and your microphone will go on. So if you have a question to ask, you can, you can do it and then everyone can hear the question. I will say, I don't think anyone has ever on purpose pressed the button. The people that press it either press it because they're like, gee, what does this do? All right. Or they, you know, they, they lean over to get their cup of coffee and inadvertently press it. So one thing I will try to do and, and try to remind me if I don't is if you have a question, I'll try to repeat the question. Like if you say, you know, what's the name of a tag to do an image? I might repeat it and say, well, a student asked, what's the name of the tag 
to, to use uh, to, to create an image or something like that. So I will try to do that. You are welcome to be a first in this class and actually press the button on purpose. But again, just based on past behavior, I'm trying to figure out, uh, trying to anticipate. All right. Are all of you familiar with Angel? You have used Angel for, okay, good. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how my class is organized. Or not. <laughs> or maybe I'll, maybe I'll just pull out my little drop someone off of a platform game. And we'll do that for the rest of the hour. All right. This will be the class that all of you will use. These will actually be disabled. They, I, I should have disabled them already this morning, but I got off to a late start. So you all log into this class. And for students, most of the action takes place on the content tab. You can also use communicate to send me emails. And you can go to Grades Manage to see your grades uh, for this class. For this class, look at the grades individually. Don't look at the average it gives you. There's some quirks in the manner in which it calculates average, so don't really worry about like the total percentage it gives you for the course. Just make sure each grade individually is correct. We're going to spend most of our time here. Getting started, please read this first. This is more or less my message to the online class, which is going to cover a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about now, so I won't read this. Copyright information for educational projects. One thing that I try to stress in this class is that despite how it's done in practice, the internet is not a free range for you to pick content out of and use for your own purposes. There are copyright laws. All right. So if you take an image from the Walking Dead website and put it on one of your web pages for this class, it falls under copyright law. Now, fortunately for us as, uh, as students and being in, edu in education, the copyright law is more flexible for us than it would be for the general public. For example, as a student, you're welcome to use some material from other websites, whether it be text or images or so on. But important thing is, is you need to give credit, just like you would if you, quoted in a, if you quoted a book in a term paper. You'd put a footnote on there and you'd say that quote was taken from such and such book. Similar on a web page. If you take an image for your Walking Dead project for this class, put a little credit on the bottom that says image from the name of the site that you got it from. All right. That's different than if you were doing this like for your own purposes, if you made a fan site or something like that. All right? um, it, it's more rigid if you do that, even if it's not for profit. A lot of people think if it's not for commercial purposes that you can still go ahead and take everything, and that's not the case. But we're fortunate in education that, that we're allowed to go and use this. This, in essence, is a guideline uh, of what you can use, how much you can use. Um, the main thing for this class will be the images. Um, for other classes of mine, there's also audio and video clips, and the copyright law covers those as well. I'll trust you to read that on your own and to ask any questions. The biggest issue is if you take a picture that you yourself did not take, give credit to where you got it from. In fact, to be safe, if you use a picture that you took, put a note on there saying, I took this picture, <laughs> all right, just so that I'm not wondering, gee, you know, where did they get this picture from? <laughs> right, right. 
Uh, syllabus, we're going we're, we're gonna to back up and talk about that in a minute. You'll notice that there's going to be a folder for each week of the semester. And um, I actually did a couple weeks. Sometimes I'm a little bit ahead of the game, um, depending on where we are at the semester. So there's a folder for each week. And in this folder will be sort of a rundown of, of, of a summary of the stuff that we're going to cover along with any assignment that you're going to have. For the most part, there's an assignment a week. All right? Um, so there's week one, there's week two. This is where the videos are going to end up. So in other words, when they give me the file for today's video, I will put a link to it in week one's folder. All right? Resources. Some of these might be out of date. If you click on a link and you get you know, an error message, let me know and I'll remove it because some of these are, are older links. These are just throughout the semesters gathered sites that have been beneficial that I will refer to in class or that I will use um, for certain things. So there's a list of class, uh, list of resources here. Semester project. For now, just be aware that you do have a semester project in this class. Sometime over the next two weeks or so, read these first three documents. The project overview, the design, and the completed. We'll talk about those within, the fir within you know, maybe three weeks down the line or so, give or take. It's not too early to start thinking about it now. Um, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail coming forward. I have a discussion forum and consider the discussion forum to be sort of like the equivalent of raising your hand in class to ask a question that you think other people in class would benefit from. All right. So maybe if there's something that's specific to your project that you're working on and you're having difficulty with, you could post it to the discussion forum if you think that other people could benefit from it. But you're also welcome to send me an email. The point is, is there's a lot of different ways you could contact me. So posting to the discussion forum has the advantage that people will see your question. People might even be able to give you advice uh, on how to handle a particular problem. And then people will see the discussion and the solution. All right, let's look at the syllabus. And I'm not going to read it word for word because nothing on earth bothers me more than when a presenter has something up on the screen and reads it verbatim. I'm like, why did I waste first and second grade learning to read then if this joker is going to read it to me word for word? So I will, I will make many mistakes in this class, but I hope that's not one mistake that I will make. All right. The top part of this is, I'm just going to sort of hit the highlights here. The top part of this is contact information. And some of the things are still to be determined. For example, when my office hours are, the times of my other labs and all that. Um, it's less that they need to be determined that I have to document it so that you can see it. So that's to be determined. The big point of this is that there's a lot of different ways to contact me. All right? Um, we each bring our own responsibilities to this class. My responsibility is to prepare lecture and assignments and activities and answer questions and so on. A big responsibility of yours is letting me know when there's some sort of disconnect, when you're just not getting, you don't, you don't understand it for whatever reason, or you didn't hear what I said, or something I said doesn't make sense to you, or whatever. All right? That's your responsibility to bring to my attention. And there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can do it during a lecture, you can do it during lab, you can do it via email. You can do it through Angel. You can th do it through the discussion forum. You can come see me during office hours or during one of my other lab sessions. So you have plenty of opportunity to do that. And if none of those work for you for whatever reason, the wild card is, is let me know and we'll figure something out. All right? We'll figure out. If, if all my office hours and labs don't meet your schedule, you know, I'll come in special just to meet with you and to discuss the stuff with you. All right? Here's a list of our official description, outcomes, and so on of the class. 
And this ought to be more than just empty words. This is the whole reason that we're here, is to get these points across and for you to understand these concepts. So do take the time to review those. Text of materials, instructor's approach, I'll let you read that. Sort of to summarize the instructor's approach section, this is your class, all right? And as such, you know, you take responsibility to let me know when you're having difficulty with stuff, to ask questions, to come to class prepared, and, and all those things so the class can run smoothly. I do use ANGEL to communicate between class sessions. So for example, and this happens, you know, a few times a semester probably in all my classes. Someone will ask me a question and I'll try to answer it, but like I'll try to change the HTML code to do something that won't work right. And I don't know why, you know, I have an extra comma in or whatever, who knows, all right? And sometimes, you know, if there's a question like that and I can't answer it, what I'll say is I'll figure it out and post it later to Angel. So usually what I do, and usually after I get a break from it for a few minutes and sit and stare at it, okay, that's what I did wrong and I, I can post the results. So I use Angel for things like that. I use Angel to post announcements. If, for example, I'm not feeling well and I know I'm not going to be here a day, I'll let you know, uh, and, and so on. So it's a good idea to check Angel periodically between class, just to see if there's, uh, between class sessions, just to see if there's any announcements or uh, other stuff. Read my policy on late assignments. To summarize it, I think compared to many professors here, I'm very flexible as far as late assignments go. I know that everyone has other responsibilities and, and so on. However, that's something that, how do I want to say, that, that you ought not, I don't want to say take advantage of, but you, you don't use it as a crutch, all right? So for example, if you have the flu and you're not able to get something done by the due date and you turn in the next day, no big deal. You know, you're late with one assignment, I probably won't deduct at all. If, however, every single assignment that's coming up, you're late, a few days late, and so on, that's a sign that something isn't working. Maybe you don't understand the material and you need some additional help from me. Maybe you're not devoting sufficient time to it. Any number of things. So use that as a warning sign, you know. A late assignment here or there because of special circumstances I don't really care about. When you continue to fall behind, it's going to more than likely get worse and worse as the semester progresses and you'll find yourself sort of behind the eight ball. So if that happens, then talk to me and we'll, we'll figure something out. The grades are broken down in this way. You'll have more or less 13 assignments, 13 homework assignments that are worth five points. Um, that's a little less than one a week. There's a couple weeks that you don't have homework assignments due. You also have a project which is done in two parts, the design, which is the plan of what you're going to do, and then finally the actual project. And that should add up to 100 points. Here's where the sort of quirk and angel comes in, is based on any number of circumstances, we may not end up exactly with 65 homework points, so if we do, I sort of prorate it. So if we're like one assignment short and you have 60 points, I'll figure out the percentage and give you that percentage out of 65 points. So again, Angel doesn't handle that subtlety very well. So don't look at that for the average. This is a basic 90 to 100 and so on for A's, B's, and C's. And then finally here is the schedule, which talks about the chapters that we're going to cover as well as what assignment is due. Now this is something that, this is one of those things as a teacher you learn that you can say something and think it's the clearest thing in the world, but people find ways to misinterpret it and you realize, well, maybe it wasn't as clear as I thought it was. 
let me review when assignments are due. All right? Assignments are due the Wednesday of the indicated week. So, for example, and this probably should say Thursday. So, see, first mistake right off the bat, but at least it wasn't reading word for word my syllabus to you. All right? Should say Thursday of each week. So, in other words, Lab 1 is due not two days from now, but nine days from now. Thursday of week two. So I give an assignment one week, and it's due the following Thursday. So week one's assignment is due the Thursday of week two. All right? So this week, there is no assignment due. The first assignment, which probably will be pretty straightforward for some of you, that's kind of why I have the second week already out there. All right. But the first assignment that you're going to work on this week is due Thursday of next week. The assignment I give for week two then will be due Thursday of week three and so on down the line. So whatever week I give an assignment in is due the following Thursday. All right. Couple exceptions to this and that is Week 11, the project design is due. We'll talk more about the project later. And your final project is due the Thursday of finals week. There are no tests or quizzes in this class. There's just assignments and the project. One thing I often do as well, which I neglected to mention, is if a student does not, if a student does an assignment and it's not quite perfect, or it, I don't want to say perfect because perfect's a bad word, um, if it's missing something important, let's put it that way, I will often ask a student to rework the assignment. All right. The idea is, is that, you know, if you were working, if this was your job, and you had to create a web page that had three links on it, and you created the web page, and those three weeks, three links didn't work, your boss wouldn't say, oh, well, that's okay, go on to, your, go on to the next part of the job, we'll just leave it like that, All right? No. The only way you're going to learn is to say, okay, let's go back and let's fix those three links to have them work the way that they're supposed to. All right. So I often do do that as well as give you the opportunity to rework something. I, I think you know, uh, w you know, one of the old sayings is you learn from your mistakes, and I don't think that is. Let, let me put it this way. Um, I would like amend that. You can learn from your mistakes, right? Um, if it was just that you automatically learn from your mistakes the Browns will be playing for the Super Bowl like for the next 10 years straight, all right? So you don't automatically learn from your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes if you figure out what went wrong and take steps to correct it. So you have the chance to learn from your mistakes, but it's not a, a done deal. So therefore, if you make a mistake on a lab, I want to give you the opportunity to learn from it. And the best way I know how to do that is figure out what you did wrong and do it right. All right, any questions over any of this? Let me take attendance, and let me take attendance in this manner because my roster actually contains everyone in the class, including those people in the online class. So you see there's 25 people listed here, even though there's not 25 people in this room. So if we can start, where did North Ridgeville go? He had enough of it. It's like, forget this. Yeah, it's like he, he said, wow, I could listen to this or I could be downloading for free applications that let me to knock crash test dummies off of ladders. All right, I was going to ask him for that. Um, let, me, uh, let me call audiovisual and...
Oh, hi, this is Mike Zellers in B105. I think we lost North Ridgeville. All right, thank you. All right. Yeah, right. It, I mean, it, it, that sounded bad. I think we lost Ridgeville, you know. Um, when it comes up, let's all pretend that, like, I gave, like, all the answers for, like, the project and told you exactly what to do and all that. And Yeah. Kind of like, like if you ask a friend to go somewhere with you and they, they, and they not, they, they don't, you, like, tell them that you had the best time ever, you know, just to kind of stick it to them. All right. Anyhow, any questions at this point? Oh, I was going to take attendance. If you could start here and give your name and give an interesting fact about yourself. <laughs> oh, I was, I was trying to figure out if that's right side up even, but it is. Yeah, right. Okay, anyhow, yes. Okay. Make something up. We're not going to check it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Huh? Okay. All right. Well, that, that's okay. That's okay. You're you're undercover. Go ahead. Next row. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And an interesting fact. Please don't say that you you work with Louis. Well, he stole it. You, you can use it in your next class if you have a class together. But go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Uh huh. Bar? All right. Go ahead. Dream interest in. Okay. Nice. And go ahead. Okay. All right. Make your own pizzas. All right, North Ridgeville. Um, yeah, uh, can you can you press the button and say your name and something interesting about yourself? <laughs> wow, that that didn't work well. All right, your name. Okay, something interesting? All right, excellent. All right. Okay, now on to the course material. All right, yeah, if you press the button again, the camera will go off you. <laughs> there you go. And it, it will point at something else in the room. I have no idea what. It kind of jumps around. <coughs> All right, let's start out talking about web pages. And the idea of web pages is, you know, the web was created by um, physis uh, scientists, I, I think they were physicists, in the European nuclear rocket science people. All right, not actually rocket science, but CERN. Tim Berners-Lee created the web, and he did it to share documents among scientists because the thing is it's like when scientists did in the old days it's like if you read a paper let's say you were you were reading a paper about some new development in science you know the paper might have a footnote talking about some other paper right and so you read you know you're you're reading about you know parallel universes and all kinds of crazy stuff like that and the person in paper A quotes another scientist in paper B saying something, and you think, wow, that sounds interesting. I would like to read more about that. Well, what would you have to do? You'd have to go and track down that 
paper in the library in some journal or whatever. All right? And what Berners-Lee said was, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could just have something where you see something that's interesting, you see another paper that's interesting, and you click on it, and boom, you're taken right to that paper. You know? And it's funny, we're so used to doing that, but at the time, that was like a revolutionary idea. Like, just link these things together. Hey, these are all computers, right? You know, should be easy. You can click on stuff. And that was where the web came in. So the idea of the web, it, it, the, the web started out with the notion of we're going to take this text, all right, text being blocks of words, and we're going to enhance it. We're going to be more than text, all right? We're not just going to be plain old text. We're going to be more than text, all right? And sort of the name that got coined for this sort of text is... Hypertext. So it's text, but it's not plain old text, it's hypertext. And hyper, you know, means more than normal, right? If you talk about someone that's hyperactive, they're more active than a, a normal person is. Or you talk about hyperspace, like in sci-fi, it's something that's like more than regular space. It's beyond regular space, and, and so on. So that was the idea, that we could take this plain old text and make hyperlinks that you could jump somewhere else to. All right? That's since been expanded to include things in addition to links to all sorts of stuff, right? Images, um, animations, audio, video, interactivity. So like when you do something, the page responds in a certain way. So really has grown from there, but still the basic idea is, is it's more than plain old text. It just keeps growing to be more and more and more. All right? Now, how do you take a plain old text document and make it do more than just regular plain old text? You do it through the use of what's called a markup language. And this is where the initials HTML, the language that web pages used, was created. Hypertext markup language. All right? So language, I think we all know what that means. What does the markup part mean? Well, the markup part is similar to what a lot of students do with their textbooks. You can insert your own joke in there. Uh, I assume you read the textbooks, but many students, like if, the, if, if you're reading the textbook, if you find something that's interesting, you might, and I don't have a highlighter, so I'll just use the pen, you might highlight it. So let's say, you're, let's say this is your textbook, and you're reading it, and this paragraph seems pretty important to you. You might highlight it. All right? Some people go crazy and like color code the highlights. All right? Those are the people that might do well to like just go take a nice walk outside and relax a little bit. You know? But still, hey, it works for them, so who am I to say? Now, if I were to say, if this was our textbook, and I were to say this paragraph here is really important, it's going to be on the final exam. You might mark it up in a different way than this paragraph where you just said, well, that seems pretty interesting. This is going to be on the exam, so I mark it up a different way. Likewise, if I were to say this paragraph here is not important, it is out of date, so don't pay attention to that. You might mark it up a different way. All right? So you have text. Still just have plain old text, but you've marked it up in a way that adds some additional meaning to it. In other words, all these paragraphs aren't the same in your mind. This is something that is interesting that you're going to want to come back and read more about later. This is something that's going to be on the test. This is something 
that is not important because it's out of date. So you've added meaning to the plain old text by marking it up with your highlighter or pen or whatever. All right, what does that have to do with web pages? Well, in web pages, we take the same approach. We take plain old text and we mark it up to give some additional meaning. In other words, this isn't just the word linked to LCCC homepage. It's not just those words. It's an actually a link that when you click on it, you get taken to that page. This is not just the words spring 2015. All right. This is a heading that's going to be the heading over a section that's going to contain more information about um, spring 2015. So how do you do that on a web page? First of all, we're going to do it by creating a plain old text file. Not a Word document, not an Excel spreadsheet, not anything like that. We're going to make a plain old text file. And for this class, and there's other alternatives as well, but for this class I keep it simple, keep it old school, as they might say, and use plain old notepad. All right. Why do I use Notepad? Well, it's the equivalent of baking pizza from scratch. All right? It's the equivalent of doing it all yourself without anything helping you. In other words, you're not, you're not, you're not calling Selenis for a pizza. You're not using a Chef Boyardee pizza making kit. You're making it yourself. What's the advantage of doing that? You're going to do it really well. All right, especially over time. All right, maybe not your first attempt, but you're going to do it really well, and you're going to make it exactly the way you want it to be. You know, hey, I like a little bit of extra pepperoni, but the Chef Boyardee box only gave me five slices, you know. Well, hey, I'm making this myself. I'll put as many slices of pepperoni as I want on it. All right. So, for that reason, I use just a plain old text editor. And the reason I use Notepad is every Windows machine has Notepad. Now, if you have a Mac, there's equivalent tools. And there's other tools that help you out a little bit, like Notepad++ and all that. And I don't mind if you use other text editors, but I, want, I don't want you to use a tool like, for example, Dreamweaver. Because Dreamweaver does too much stuff for you. All right. And what happens when something, software does something for you? It does it the way it thinks it's best. And I want us to learn the nuts and bolts of this stuff. All right. So let me go in and let me go and let me start Notepad here. And we're going to start out our discussion of HTML by talking about some basic tags that are going to be on almost all your pages. Or I'll, I'll say it. It's going to be on all your pages. All right. And then we'll go over some tags that are very common that you're going to use on many or most of your pages. Scratch that. Rewind. We'll talk about the common tags later. I'm going to start off by creating a fragment of a web page. Then we'll go in and we'll fill in the additional stuff in a minute here. What I want to do is I want to create a web page that's going to have um, a couple headings and a couple paragraphs. All right, we'll start out with those basic tags and we'll go and we'll add the other tags later. All right. So, I'm going to put, I will make a page about myself.
went up. All right. That might be content that I want on a page. All right. I'm going to go and I'm going to save this as an HTML document. All right. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to change that instead of saving saving as type text files, I'm going to save it as all files. I'm going to put it on the desktop and I'm going to call it first.html. It's important to do this. The .html at the end of the file tells different things that this is a web page. This isn't a Word document or an image or anything like that. So it's important that you use the .html at the end of your file name. Now one thing that with Windows, Windows oftentimes hides these last characters, what are called file extensions. All right, but we're going we, we're gonna to need to see those because we're going to need to know precise file names, not just part of the file name. So I'm going to save this. And you'll notice that on the desktop, there it is, first. And I can tell it's a web page because it gave me the little Internet Explorer icon. That is the um, default browser on this particular machine, Internet Explorer. So it gave me that icon. Now, it's not enough just to see that name, though. So I'm going to go in and, depending on the version of Windows you have, you can go in and not hide the file extensions. And now we'll see the full name of it, first.html. So one thing you want to do is make sure that you're seeing the file extensions. Okay, so now I have this file. I have it in Notepad. And I can view it in a web browser because it's a web page. All right? So there's only one file. This is something that some students get confused about, thinking that there's a file in Notepad and there's a file in the web browser. There's only one file, but we're going to look at it two different ways. It would be like the difference between taking a photograph of someone and taking an x-ray of them. All right? Still the same person, You're just, you just have two different views of this, of, of this person. This is more or less like the x-ray. We're seeing sort of the guts of the file. What we're going to see in the browser is what the rest of the world is going to see, like the surface of it. And if I look, and if I bring this up in the web browser by double clicking it, I notice that I don't get much of anything. All right? I just get plain old text. Why is that? Because I didn't mark up the text. I didn't tell the browser what each piece of text means. All right? So let's look at this again. This is sort of like the top heading of the page, right? This is the most important idea of this page. This page is about Mike Zellers. If I was making an outline, I would do this. That this is a, this is a page about Mike Zellers. Here's the stuff that he teaches. Here's his hobbies. Then maybe I would have another professor here at LC. Maybe I'd have Don Huffman teaching and hobbies and so on down the line. I haven't put anything in this file, though, to mark up the code, to tell the browser, hey, this is what this means. And that's where we come into what are called tags. Tags are the equivalent of a highlighter where we're going to tell the web browser this is what this means. So, this is a top level heading. We're doing an outline, this will be a top level heading. Therefore, it gets marked up with an H1 tag. I'm going to put these tags in and then I'm going to talk about them in more detail. Teaching, if you remember our outline, was a second level heading. So I'm going to make that an H2. Hobbies, 
was also a second level heading, right? Remember, we're not saying this is a first heading, second heading, third heading. We're saying this is a top level or first level heading. These two, if they're on an outline, they'd be on the same level, teaching and hobbies. And therefore, they're both H2s. Finally, these are just plain old paragraphs. They're not headings at all. So I'm going to put those in a paragraph tag. Now, a couple things we're going to notice here. Tags come in pairs. Tags are these things that are included in the angle brackets, or greater than or less than signs. All right? So this is a start tag. This is an end tag. The star tag is where we say, hey, starting here, this is where my top level heading starts. And this is where the top level heading ends. So from here to here. It would be like the equivalent if I was highlighting pages in a book. If I said, this is important up to here. Where it starts to be important, where it ends to be important. Same idea. What's the difference between a start and ending tag? The ending tag has a slash before the name of the tag. So this is an H1, means a top level heading. This is an end H1, which means that is where the top level heading ends. This is an H2, which is a second level heading, and here is where the second level heading ends. So everything between here and here is the first level heading. Everything between here and here is the second level heading. Everything between here and here is my paragraph, and so on down the line. Now I can go and save this, and I can go and view it in my browser again, and we'll notice this time it's going to look a little different. Just hit refresh, and there. There it likes this. Looks like this. And it's starting to look a little bit more like a actual web page because everything isn't run together. Why not? Because we tagged it. We told the browser how to treat different pieces of the page. This isn't just one big old line of text. This is different sections of the page that we want formatted and structured in a certain way. All right? So we do that via tags. Again, one file, we're looking at the internals of it, and then we're seeing how the rest of the world's going to see it when they view it in the browsers. Important things to remember. These tag names are predefined. You can't just make up tags of your own. They have specific meanings. H1 means a top level heading. H2 means a second, secondary level. P means paragraph. There's actually H1 through H6. Which, if you think about that, does that mean that you can only have six headings on a page? No. You can only have six levels of headings on the page. And if you think about it, that's pretty involved. If you need more than six levels of headings on the page, maybe you want to think about designing your page in a different way. Because that, that would be fairly complex. Tags come in pairs with the starting tag and the ending tag. A couple things we're going to talk about next time, we're, we're running out of time, is first of all, notice that these extra spaces don't really matter. In other words, I could put a whole bunch of spaces here and that doesn't matter. Page still displays the same. All right? That's actually a good thing because that way we can write the code in a readable fashion and the browser figures out how to display it and displays it without adding all these additional spaces. All right. Your first assignment is to go and find some information about a number of topics and that are relevant in this class, HTML, CSS, and a couple other things. 
So if you're not sure, if you know, if you want to, I would suggest that you try maybe starting to do an exercise like this in lab. If you want to work on your lab assignment and you're not really comfortable with creating a web page yet, just start doing the research. Start going online and looking for these topics and write down the links that you find so that when we, when we talk about creating links and we talk about the rest of the HTML tags that you need, you'll be able to go in and finish the assignment then. All right, any questions? Any questions in North Ridgeville? All right, we'll see you up in lab. Our lab is in BU 202.